Hi there, welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough. This is Gizmo and Widget, my traveling companions. And welcome back to our series, Hidden Gems in the Cotswolds. We're traveling on your behalf through the center of the Cotswolds, seeking out smaller places you might easily not come across, little villages, churches, even the occasional artifact. Come with us and let's go and find some wonderful Cotswold gems. We're starting here in Charlton Abbots, an extraordinary little hamlet, wonderfully peaceful on a beautiful spring day. And we're going to work our way through the center of the heart of the Cotswolds. Come with us. As you climb eastward out of Winchcombe, it would be easy to miss the little hamlet of Charlton Abbots. It's off the little road from Winchcombe to Sevenhampton a little signpost, the only thing to tip you off to its existence. The much extended but impressive Tudor manor house, surrounded by its outbuildings, a few cottages and a tiny church are all you will find in this little place. It's the extraordinarily beautiful surroundings that make it so special. That and its history. As its name suggests, Charlton Abbots belonged to Winchcombe Abbey, and it was here that the monks had a leper's house, a refuge indispensable in medieval times. Whether any traces of it are still left is doubtful, but an ancient thatched cottage is believed to occupy its site. When you know the purpose for which the monks used this place, it gives it a little extra magic. Despite the terrible ravages of the dreadful disease, they did their very best to protect and look after the unfortunate victims, and they chose a stunningly beautiful piece of countryside in which to care for them. The little church dedicated to St. Martin is ancient, but we know it was in ruins in the 18th century, and remains so until around 1887, when it was restored giving it, amongst other things, the tiled floor we see today and the stained glass in the chancel. Evans writes in 1905, Hard by is a spring of beautifully clear water collected into a circular basin large enough for a bath, whence it flows northwards to the River Severn. At no great distance is another spring which finds its way southwards to the Thames. It's a true watershed. Ross, the dogs and I stood on the public footpath in the field just below the church, with red kites and buzzards circling in the blue sky above us, reveling in the beauty of the view in which the hills opposite played havoc with our sense of perspective. Something we've often noticed in these hills is the way in which the slopes provide a kind of backdrop to the views, which bring things closer to you. It's a strange sensation, but one that never fails to please. This area of the Cotswolds is crisscrossed with public footpaths, clearly marked, and Charlton Abbots has its share. A good map should allow you to plan a walk so as to include this little hamlet, and we suggest that you will find the trouble well worthwhile. When you can tear yourself away from the beauty of Charlton Abbots, Go back to the main road between Winchcombe and Sevenhampton, and the next village along is called Brockhampton, with its extraordinary manor house. This part of England is dotted with houses of this kind, almost all of which have to find ways to survive in a world where a house with four times more servants than residents is a difficult one to justify or maintain. The building of Brockhampton Park was started in about 1640 by Paul Pert, a close financial advisor to Charles I. He died a few years later, and it passed to his niece Anne Skipwith. 
Anne's great-granddaughter, Mary Dodwell, later inherited the estate, and she married in 1746 Thomas Tracy, the owner of Stanway House, which we visited recently. Now, this convenient marriage and consolidation of wealth allowed the families to maintain houses like this without too much difficulty. Over the centuries, however, ownership of this great place changed many times, until, in the mid-19th century, it passed to the Craven family. They enlarged the house substantially over the next two generations and created the house and gardens you see today. During the Second World War, the house was used as part of the Cheltenham Ladies' College, and shortly after the war as a recovery home for wounded soldiers. Then, briefly, a country club was based here, and then it became the corporate headquarters for various companies. More recently, as the upkeep became prohibitive, the house became increasingly difficult to maintain, and it was offered to the National Trust, who, in the absence of an endowment big enough to keep it up, refused the gift, and eventually it took a turning that even in this part of the world, so rich in houses like this, is rare. It was bought by a housing developer, Barrett Developments. They turned it into the 21 flats that it remains today. They also converted many outbuildings and estate cottages, and it is now one of the rare places where it's possible to own a small piece of history and live, at least in your imagination, like the aristocracy of old. Whilst looking for a place to fly our drone, we drove back to the western edge of the village, where we caught sight of something really unexpected. There, on the drive to a farm, stood a small herd of elephants. At first sight they looked completely real, and we thought we should be careful with the drone. A herd of stampeding elephants in Gloucestershire would have been an embarrassment. However, they turned out to be made of wood. We aren't quite sure what these beautiful creatures are, or for how long they'll be there, but they are amazing. There were even a couple of life-sized camels in the barn, one leaning slightly drunkenly with crossed legs against the wall. At the other end of the estate, a little lane leads down to the village. This sleepy little place is extremely quiet and the roads are narrow and bendy but if you're walking, it's certainly worth the effort. There's a small set of buildings which used to be a brewery. Sold to Shoals Brewery in 1921, they stopped brewing in 1927, but early home brew kits were manufactured here and sold right up until 1939. The date stone on the brewery building suggests that malting was carried out by the Wood family on the site since 1769. In 1998, the buildings were refurbished, the chimney stack reconstructed, and now it's a private residence. The distance between Brockhampton and Sevenhampton is just a short walk, which is lucky, really, because the population of Brockhampton used the Sevenhampton church as their place of worship. This is another fabulous little hamlet we're going to show you around, and we're going to show you this extraordinary little church which probably can claim to be the smallest of all the Cotswold wool churches. Come with me. The people of Brockhampton, the village we visited just west of here, would walk the mile or two to church in the village of Sevenhampton, pronounced locally Sennington, I understand, where we are now. The Church of St Andrew was formerly a chapelry of Prestbury and Norman in origin, but it was very much altered and enriched under the will of John Camber, who died around 1497. Camber was a merchantman from Worcester, who almost certainly had a wool business in the Cotswolds and is buried in this church. He was responsible for the central tower, the south porch, as well as the remodelling of the 13th century transepts. It's the central tower inserted with Camber's money and under his instruction, that gives this church its unique and charming character. 
The width of its east arch more or less coincides with that of the narrow chancel, which make the similar west arch and the four centred north and south arches narrower than the nave and transepts, so the whole required a complicated array of buttresses to hold it all up. There's a wonderful vaulted ceiling at the cross, lit by natural light from the high windows above, and the belfry is housed above it. There are two fonts, one probably 17th century, shaped like a chalice, and the more recent and more often used, decorated with large angels, dated 1892. There is a small brass inset in the wall of the church's benefactor, John Camber, a small monument in a small church to a generous man who clearly fell for this part of the world and the people in it. This little church can certainly claim the title of a Cotswold wool church, having largely been paid for out of the proceeds of a local wool business, but it has none of the pomp and grandiosity that you find in the more famous wool churches of, for instance, North Leach or Burford. It is small, compact and beautifully formed, a classic Cotswold gem. Overlooking the church from the east is the old vicarage, this is a Victorian building built in Tudor Gothic style and it adds to the grave atmosphere around the church. The ridge above Sennington forms the watershed of this part of the Cotswold. Evans writes, Hard by is a spring of beautifully clear water collected into a circular basin large enough for a bath, whence it flows northwards to the River Severn. At no great distance is another spring, which finds its way southwards to the Thames. We haven't found the springs yet, but we're planning to examine the amazing network of waterways, both natural and man-made, rivers, streams, canals, fountains, fish ponds, etc., for a later programme, so we'll find them in the end, perhaps with your help. The river that starts here and flows south towards the North Sea is the River Colne, which we've come across many times over the years, providing us with fabulously beautiful walks near Hatherup and Colne St Albans, delicious trout from Bybury, and much more. In the late Middle Ages, roads and paths crossing or touching the parish were used by travellers to and from Winchcombe and the pilgrimage destination of Hales Abbey, just to the north. In 1531, a route near the centre of the parish was known as Hales Way, and in 1611, a man was brought up in front of the beak at the manor court for having ploughed up an old footpath to Hales. The Market Way, recorded in 1626, probably followed the route of the road from Syreford in Whittington to Winchcombe, and was known in 1638 as the Port Way. In the mid-19th century, the road linked Winchcombe with the Cheltenham-London Road at Andoversford, and it remains the most important south-north route through the parish today. We're heading cross-country along the ridge a little now, towards a village of guiding power. This place we've visited before, but it's definitely worth coming back. We've come along the hill from Sevenhampton, not far, to the little village of Guiting Power. This is the parish from which the tiny Chapel of Ease was built in Farmcote that we visited a couple of weeks ago. It's very beautiful. We're going to show you around. The story of Guiting Power is one that closely follows the fortunes of the agricultural communities in the region. When Evans passed through here in 1905, it had just started to recover from a period of deep decay, and I will read you what he wrote at the time shortly. The village is built on the site of an Anglo-Saxon settlement, which was called Geiting Brock, and there is evidence that people lived here from at least 780 AD. It was a royal estate or manor under Edward the Confessor, but by the time of the Norman invasion and the Doomsday Book of 1086, the village had started to decline. It sits on a tributary of the River Windrush, which could have something to do with the origin of its difficult-to-pronounce name. 
The Anglo-Saxon word geeting meant rushing. The power bit certainly refers to the name of the medieval lords of the manor. The village rose and fell with the fortunes of the landlords and the farming industry, until in 1905 Evans cycled through the village and wrote the following description. Above Naunton we keep to the stream, and the towering woods of Guiting Grange soon arise before us. This was a grange of Bruin Abbey in the Evenlode Valley near Kingham, and a few remains of a chapel, supposed to have been a mortuary chapel for the inmates, can still be traced in a field at some distance from the house. While the names Trinity Ford and By Our Way Peace remain to indicate the road taken by the funeral procession. We may leave the grange on our right and strike across the fields to lower guiting or guiting power. The church stands at the end of the village, the faithful witness to the fortunes of its inhabitants. We will turn aside and try to read them here. All is now the picture of seemliness, but in 1902 the crumbling fabric reflected only too faithfully the decayed condition of the village. For in recent years, the population of Lower Guiting has diminished by nearly one half, and some 30 cottages now stand untenanted and in various stages of dilapidation. But in the old days, it was as prosperous a village as any of its compeers. Here settled the Norman Lord, and here he built the Norman church of the Cotswold type we already know so well. Two richly ornamented doorways of this period still remain, and a transition Norman chancel arch with similar ornamentation survived till the alterations of 1820. In the 12th century, or early in the 13th, the beautiful early English chancel was built and in the 15th, when the wool trade was at its height, the tower was added, and the walls of the nave raised to receive the present low-pitched roof. So far, all was well, but with the 19th century came the enclosures, and the large profits which followed the new style of farming. With increase of prosperity came increase of population, and it was determined to enlarge the church in the improved fashion of the day. Accordingly, at an interval of twenty years, in 1820 and 1844, the north and south transepts were thrown out from the nave. Towards the close of the century came the days of agricultural depression, and the church and village became partners in decay. Three years ago, in 1902, the former presented a melancholy spectacle the nave and transepts in their squalid, deformed condition were alone used for service. For fifteen years the chancel had been boarded off and was fast going to ruin. But at last, mainly owing to the quiet determination and persistent effort of the present curate in charge, money was collected and a restoration worthy of the name has been carried out. It was found absolutely necessary to rebuild the chancel, but the conservative spirit in which the work was undertaken is evidenced by the following inscription on a small brass plate affixed to the priest's door. At the restoration in 1903, this chancel doorway and small window were not disturbed. The cane stone pulpit was created and installed at this time, resting on a 15th century stem. Along with the four stained glass windows in the north and east walls of the chancel. Discovered in the church during its restoration and placed now beside the pulpit is the touchingly poignant medieval stone coffin made for an infant. For the first time in many years exploring the churches of this region, I noticed that the door to the tiny steep stone stairway to the belfry wasn't locked, so I sent Ross up the stairs to get a glimpse of the bells amongst the ancient rafters. This is a sight few of us will be privileged to see, 
and I hope the vicar won't be too cross with me for taking advantage of someone's unfortunate mistake with the padlock. In the 1930s, around a dozen of the village cottages were bought by one Moira Davidson, with a view to restoring them to their former beauty, but her timing was unfortunate, and the war and the depression that followed thwarted her admirable intentions and by the 1950s the village was once again in a state of dreadful disrepair. However, in 1968, the manor of Guiting Power and half the houses in the village were bought by Raymond Cochrane. He formed the Guiting Manor Amenity Trust, a charitable organisation who still own and run the estate. They have restored many of the houses and the village now has an air of energy and drive it hasn't seen for a while. The green around the War Memorial Cross has a buzz, even with all that's going on in the world at the moment, and the old post office, whose owner recently retired, has been taken on anew and was due to reopen a few days after our visit, offering, along with its normal post office services, food and drink from local producers. They will continue to provide coffees and breakfasts for local early risers, as well as a real touch of Cotswold hospitality for visitors from afar. The village has two pubs. One, the Farmer's Arms, very much a local, where you can expect the corner bar stool to have been occupied by the same person for the last ten years. And at the other end of the village, the Hollow Bottom, one of the pubs opened by one of the region's more successful dining pub chains, the Lucky Onion Group, and just recently bought out by Young's Brewery. It's a lovely little village, this. A classic Cotswold village, and still slightly muddy, run by its locals, and very jolly atmosphere. We've enjoyed being here. It's lovely fun. We're now going to move on a little bit further to Temple Guiting to show you what that's like. As we mentioned in Guiting Power, or Lower Guiting, the name probably originates from the old English word for gushing, the village sits on the river Windrush, albeit quite close to its source. But the temple part of the name relates to the fact that this land and manor belonged to the Knights Templar. In the middle of the 12th century, the Preceptory of Temple Guiting was founded. It was a medieval monastic house funded by donations of land and money from the Norman families of Lacey and Waterville. Some of you may remember the family name of Lacey coming up in our recent travels around this western edge of the Cotswolds. The Weems family at Stanway, no more than a couple of miles from here, is descended from the Laceys. The Knights Templar were established in 1119 and given papal recognition in 1129. It was a Catholic medieval military order started by a small number of mainly French knights resolved to protect pilgrims to the sacred sites in the Levant, the eastern end of the Mediterranean. The knights took a vow of poverty and chastity, and basing themselves in Jerusalem, they dedicated their lives to the protection of the wandering pilgrims from all over the Christian world. In 1120, King Baldwin II, king of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, gave the Knights Templar his palace, the former Aqsa Mosque, on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem to use as their headquarters. This building was commonly referred to as the Temple of Solomon, and so the military brotherhood became known as the Templars. Initially, the brotherhood was seen as a kind of offshoot of the Cistercian Order, and they wore the distinctive Cistercian white hooded mantle over their armour but soon they identified themselves by adding a red cross, and this red cross on a white background became their mark, closely associated, in the minds of my generation at least, with the Crusades of the 12th and 13th centuries. Huge donations came into the Brotherhood as they grew, and the Templars became wealthy and powerful providing one of the very first international banking services to the nations of the world, as well as the military support for the religious wars. The Preceptory of Guiting was a kind of regional office of the London arm of the Templars. 
Unfortunately, the Templars became a little too powerful and influential for the likings of the European rulers, particularly the French king, and eventually they were accused, almost certainly fallaciously, of all kinds of infamy, and finally disbanded at the beginning of the 14th century. The brothers were all arrested, many tortured and executed, and the preceptor of Guiting, John de Coningston, was sent to the monastery at Worcester, where his keep was paid for from the income from Guiting. The church in this village is an unusual building. In about 1740, a Dr George Torbert was appointed to the incumbency, and he left his mark in more ways than one. He spent a thousand pounds beautifying the church according to the taste of his day, and as Evans relates, it remains an astonishing example of the enormities which the taste of the day was capable of. He really hated this church, and it's true that traditionalists are somewhat mortified by what's been done here, but the passing of the years has perhaps made it less horrific to the eyes of the 21st century. The font is a pretty example of the octagonal fonts we've seen often before, and it boasts an engraved glass cover by Bryant Fedden, made in 1974. The pulpit is 18th century, made of oak and finely carved and inlaid. There's a huge and elaborate plaster royal arms of George III hanging under the 18th century tower arch. And there are three good panels of stained glass from around 1500. The other nine of this group of stained glass panels is now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. When Evans came through here in 1905, he writes of a village more peaceful than which it would be hard to find. There is no inn, the great house is untenanted, the children are at school and their elders in the fields. The cottage doors stand open, and it is with some difficulty that you at last come across an inhabitant who encourages you to proceed another mile on your journey to the plough at Ford. The Plough is a great pub, where Ross and I have eaten several times, in the heart of horse racing territory, owned by the local Donington Brewery, and Evans relates the sign on the gable of the building, which read, in those days, Ye weary travellers that pass by, with dust and scorching sunbeams dry, or be he numbed with snow and frost, with having these bleak Cotswolds crossed, step in! and quaff my nut-brown ale, bright as rubies mild and stale, twill make your lagging trotters dance, as nimble as the sons of France. And then ye will own, ye men of sense, that ne'er was better spent six pence. Our next stop is a little south of here. We're going to try and find a village that Ross spotted from the road. It's called Naunton. We've arrived in our final destination in this episode of Cotswold Jams, in a little village on the Windrush River called Naunton. It's exceptionally beautiful, and the weather is matching the beauty of the place. We'll show you around, come with me. Driving along the B4068 from Stow on the World, Ross looked down to his right to see this sleeping little village. From the road above, it seemed to have it all. A beautiful church, a winding stream through its centre, with an ancient stone bridge spanning the flow. Surely a perfect Cotswold gem. Why was it that we hadn't been here before? Well, oddly enough, it was partly because of our valued friend and travelling companion, Herbert Evans. His description of this place in 1905 was anything but complimentary. He wrote of it, A prosaic little place enough, though if we are to believe Samuel Rudder, the second of the county's historians, one of the healthiest in England, boasting as it did a death rate of less than 1%. Its distinction on this count has not, however, resulted in investing it with any great attraction and when we have looked at all that remains of the capital mansion, to wit, a cyclopean dovecot, square with four great gables, but in these latter days destitute of doves, 
we may leave the village without a sigh and continue our pursuit of the wind rush up the green valley that takes us to the Geitings. I think we can be forgiven for thinking that we should perhaps avoid burdening you with this little village. If it hadn't been for Ross's chance glimpse from the road, we would certainly have passed by. But it would have been a mistake. This little place has an air of peace and tranquility about it that to me at least is wonderfully attractive. The little village square is dominated by an enormous tree filled with rooks. At this time of year they're extremely noisy. I'm not sure I'd like to live in the old centre of this village even though the houses and cottages are beautiful. I suppose you just must get used to the racket. The church is probably 12th century in origin, but what we see is almost all late perpendicular, so 15th century onwards. The three-stage tower is a fine example with buttresses on the lower stages, and gargoyles, battlements and pinnacles with carved heads. There are two sundials painted on the walls on the south and west. The churchyard is beautifully kept, neat but not too manicured, loved but not smothered. We notice, at this time of uncertainty and worry, their support for the country of Ukraine. Inside, the font is octagonal, as usual, with decorations, four-leafed clovers and tracery, oddly similar to the north window in the north aisle. The choir space was created during a restoration in 1899. There's an interesting marble tablet, highly decorated to Ambrose Olds. It says, Son of Dr. William Olds, barbarously murdered by ye rebels in 1645, and then explains that Ambrose died with better fortune, for he escaped many and eminent dangers in battles, fought for ye honour and service of his king. The church's greatest treasure, however, is its pulpit. It's beautifully carved in stone in the late 15th century, with lovely canopied panels and elegant tracery. What a pleasure it must be to preach from such a position. The village was extended across the river in the 16th century, but until 1819 the only way across was by a ford. The bridge was built in that year by the rector, John Hurd. Now the village extends nearly a mile along the river towards the old mill at the end. There are a few buildings worth noticing along the way, in particular the Baptist Chapel, which was one of the first to be built on this side of the river. Ross and I stopped for a bite of lunch at the Black Horse Inn, where we were welcomed with generosity. We were lucky to be here on a sunny spring day, and we sat outside feeling the world returning to a semblance of normality. We enjoyed this little place, and we're glad we didn't miss it altogether. It's been an extraordinary little journey. We've hardly left the parish of Guiting uh, during our, this episode of uh, The Hidden Gems. They're all within just a few miles of one another, and Norton is the perfect finale. This lovely valley with its steep sides and the river wind rush running gently through the middle of it. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. We'll be back soon. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You can find us on all, all the usual platforms. Um, and we'll be back in the very near future. Bye-bye.